diols and sulfides. These are compounds that contain sulfur. Think of a thiol as the sulfur analog of an alcohol. An alcohol is ROH, so a thiol is RSH. Think of sulfides as the sulfur analog of an ether. An ether is two R groups bridged by an oxygen. So a sulfide is two R groups bridged by a sulfur. And because sulfur and oxygen are both in group 16, these compounds are isoelectronic. Here is 3-methyl-1-butanol. Replace the OH with SH, and you get 3-methyl-1-butane-thiol. You can also call the SH group a mercapto group, because they like to bind to mercury. So this compound on the right you could also call 1 Mercapto 3 methylbutane. Here is a compound that is both a thiol and an alcohol at the same time. Now you want to name this as an alcohol because the most oxidized carbon is the one that is alpha to the hydroxyl group. So 1-butanol is the parent, and there is a sulfhydryl group on carbon-3. So hence we call this 3-mercapto, three 3-methyl, three 1-butanol. If you happen to get mercury poisoning, they'll treat you with dimercaprol. And so if we number it, we give the alpha carbon to the hydroxyl the lowest number. And this is a mercaptogroup group on carbon 2 and a mercaptogroup group on carbon 3. So 2,3-dimercapto-1-propanol, dimercaprol for short. And this is perfect for chelating a mercury ion. Thiols smell bad. When I was in graduate school, one of my colleagues was doing synthesis with some thiols. I cried and cried about the smell in the lab. It's skunk smell. When skunks spray you, they're spraying you with a thiol. Say you go to light the stove in your house, and it doesn't light, and you smell gas. You're actually not smelling the gas. Methane has no odor. What you're smelling is methane thiol. Your nose is very well attuned to smell thiols. You can detect it at the parts per million level. So you might think that the chemistry of thiols is similar to the chemistry of alcohols. And you'd be right to a point. But you have to consider the hydrosulfide ion, HS-, minus, that's isoelectronic with the hydroxide ion.
HO minus. However, whereas hydroxide is both a strong base and a strong nucleophile, which complicates your outcomes, the hydrosulfide ion is not a base. It is, however, a very, very strong nucleophile. The result, sulfhydride, will do substitution only and no elimination. And if your substrate is not tertiary, it's going to go SN2. If it's tertiary, it'll go SN1 because of sterics. So if you have an alkyl halide and you react it with sulfhydride, you get a thiol. If you have a secondary alkyl halide and you're producing a chirality center, you will get inversion. If we have a tertiary alkyl halide and we react it with sodium sulfhydride, we'll get a mixture of inversion and retention products because it goes SN1 as opposed to SN2. And of course, that'll be a 50-50 mixture of retention and inversion product when it's SN1. Reacting a thiol with sodium hydroxide followed by bromine molecule will give you a disulfide. That's the sulfur analog of peroxide. Let's look at the mechanism. In the first step, hydroxide deprotonates the thiol. This gives a thiolate. Thiolate is the conjugate base of a thiol. It is the sulfur analog of an alkoxide. This particular compound here is ethane thiolate. In the second step, this ethane thiolate attacks the bromine, and we get loss of a leaving group. That's classic SN2. Now we have a leaving group. And your other thiolate molecule, a strong nucleophile, is going to do SN2 attack. Generating the disulfide. You can make a sulfide by reacting a thiol first with sodium hydroxide to deprotonate it, and then with an alkyl halide. In this case, we're going to make ethyl ethyl sulfide. Just like diethyl ether, but with a sulfur instead of an oxygen bridging. Let's look at the mechanism. In the first step, sodium hydroxide acts as a base, deprotonates the thiol, We get ethane thiolate. Which is then going to do nucleophilic attack on the alpha carbon of the alkyl halide. Giving us our sulfide. I can make trialkyl sulfonium. This is trialkyl sulfonium. Sulfonium because it's got a cation on the sulfur, trialkyl because there are three R groups. So if I take my sulfide and I react it with an alkyl halide, 
guess what? That sulfide is still a very strong nucleophile. So it's going to do nucleophilic attack, an SN2 attack, on my alkyl halide. And so I've got my trialkyl sulfonium. If I then react my trialkyl sulfonium with a nucleophile, the nucleophile will attack the least bulky of the alkyl groups, and the sulfide will leave. So trialkyl sulfonium is a potent alkylating agent. Thiols can be oxidized. One equivalent of oxidation gets us to a sulfoxide, right? Remember DMSO? That's a methyl group attached to a sulfoxide attached to another methyl group. Dimethyl sulfoxide. If we oxidize our sulfoxide further, we get to a sulfone, which is the sulfur with two double bonded oxygens. What oxidizing agent are we going to use? If you want to just go to a sulfoxide, use sodium metapariodate. NaIO4. The IO4 minus ion is metapariodate. That is a more mild oxidizing agent. If, however, we use excess hydrogen peroxide, that will oxidize us all the way to a sulfone because hydrogen peroxide is a stronger oxidizing agent. So, the oxidizing agent we use depends on how far we're trying to go. Just like oxidation of a primary alcohol. If you use Jones reagent, that's strong enough to take you to the most oxidized, carboxylic acid. If you use pyridinium chlorochromate, or the Swern oxidation, or DMP, you'll only go to an aldehyde.